better, cheaper products. You name it, TVs, laptops, sofas, EU regulation and trade barriers pushes up the price of everything. The cost of living goes up, Europeans get poorer. But it wasn't just manufacturers who sought protection. Farmers like it when food prices are high. So when a French farmer, say, finds that African farmers are beginning to sell their produce in Europe, he's not happy. Our EU commissioner knows the routine. Tariffs, quotas, regulations, saying you need to wear berets and drink Ricard to grow food. This is particularly pernicious for African producers of food who find that they face a big tariff barrier when trying to export to Europe. Now, that's bad for them because they can't earn money, and it's bad for British consumers because their food costs more. But not content with trade barriers, farmers wanted the EU to drive food prices still higher. To that end, the EU bought gigantic amounts of agricultural produce and simply allowed it to rot, creating an artificial shortage which pushed up prices. These were the famous wine lakes and butter mountains. In northern France, part of the so-called butter mountain. The British say that heaps of butter like this are indefensible follies. The French say they're necessary and completely sensible. It didn't take long for people to wise up to the absurdity of it. Um, and not just its absurdity, its immorality, frankly. All this is rotten for us consumers. Because of the EU, for decades, food and drink has cost far more than it should. It adds between 10 and 20% to the cost of food. But it gets worse. Let's look at protectionism and the steel industry. If you're a steel producer, you don't like the idea of cheap steel coming in from America or Asia. You'd much rather the EU shut up some trade barriers. Great for steel producers, but what if you're a steel consumer? Suppose you make bridges or railway lines or cranes or robots or ships or trains or cars or space shuttles or other things made of steel. You now have to pay more for your steel than your competitors in, say, South Korea or Brazil. Protecting one producer has raised costs for other producers. The disease spreads. Instead of one uncompetitive industry, we now have many. To see how this works in practice, I've come to the Tate and Lyle Sugar Refinery in London. For centuries, raw sugar has been coming into the Thames in huge quantities to be refined in factories like this. In the raw sugar shed, over 60,000 tons of raw cane sugar stands ready for processing. Outside is Tate and Lyle's own dock. In years gone by, this was crowded with boats from countries like Brazil and Australia and India, queuing up to offload their cargo. The European Union is the biggest drag on the competitiveness of our business. And what precisely are they doing, which is the problem? Well, you can see behind me on the jetty today that there's no boat here with raw sugar, and that's precisely our problem. Um, the boats that deliver our raw sugar here to London, the, the sugar on them, uh, the cost of that is inflated by the fact that Euro the European Union restricts who we can buy that sugar from, and on much of the sugar they also charge us import tariffs. When inefficient European beet sugar producers asked the EU for protective barriers against cane sugar producers around the world, it was a blow to refiners like Tate and Lyle. On some of the boats of sugar that we bring in, we can be paying anywhere between two to three and a half million euros in extra costs because of the European policies. As costs have risen, so has the price of sugar for consumers, while Tate and Lyle's turnover and profits have been hit. It threatens the 850 jobs here in East London, and it's meant that we've had to downsize the refinery by about 50% since 2009. How strong is the feeling against the EU at the moment here? Walk around the refinery, talk to the people here. They absolutely know that no matter how hard they work, no matter how productive they are, the regulations that the European Union set can still crush us. Protecting inefficient producers ends up dragging down good producers. 
Whereas up till 2009, we were exporting 300,000 tonnes of sugar because the European regulations have made us uncompetitive. Not only have we stopped exporting that sugar, but we also now face around 250,000 tonnes of imports into the UK to compete with as well. So it's a double whammy, if you like. And we estimate that probably costs the UK economy something like 80 to 90 million euros a year, just for this one factory. Instead of looking out to the whole world, what we see is the EU bringing up the drawbridge. The EU has slid from free trade into crony capitalism and protectionism. Protection hurts consumers who have to pay more for inferior products. It hurts industries whose costs are forced higher. In the end, it even hurts the firms who are protected. Protecting a firm from competition does not make it more competitive. Suddenly you can <laughs> relax and put the kettle on. Competition forces you to be sharp and buck up your ideas. Remove that and it's like pulling the plug out. By protecting more and more industries year after year, Europe has ended up with a moribund, ailing economy. If you prop up failing, antiquated businesses that can't naturally compete, you get stagnation in the economy, not growth. Protectionism impoverishes all of Europe. It makes all of us worse off. Then the shock came when the World Trade Organization, or WTO, was set up. The walls of fortress Europe began to crumble. From the developed world to the developing world, the tariff reductions are expected to sow the seeds of global economic growth. The World Trade Organization, where both we and the European Union are members, has made huge progress in sweeping away tariffs and other barriers. We have begun to see an opening up of the markets, thanks largely to the World Trade Organization. Every major country in the world is now bound by its rules. Tariffs and other trade barriers were shredded, as you can see. The World Trade Organization has driven down most of the tariffs. In the EU, the average tariff on agricultural products has fallen to 12%, and on manufactured goods, just 4%. Europe's industries now face the challenge of international competition. I think the European Union is learning a very hard lesson. But if you're insulated from competition decade after decade, it comes as a bit of a shock when it arrives. Growth in the EU, already feeble, has more or less ground to a halt, with youth unemployment reaching staggering proportions. The EU badly needs its own post-war German-style economic miracle. But far from slashing regulation, the mountainous burden keeps growing. It constantly wants to achieve growth through harmonization, top-down control, and central direction. And we know those don't work. It militates against precisely the kind of individual initiative and innovation that is at the heart of economic growth. Regulation is the enemy of competition, and competition is the engine of growth. Therefore, it is no surprise that the European Union has become an economic basket case. Every continent now is outgrowing Europe. When you think of the growth rates in China, and then you look at the growth rate in the European Union, that tells me that we are in the wrong place. We joined the European Union, and it's become the world's only declining trade bloc. Far from hitching our wagon to a dynamic economic locomotive, we've shackled ourselves to a corpse. The people have never given a bigger vote of no confidence in Brussels. Today, world markets were nervously watching. The stock market has not been reassured. What the European Union has become in the 21st century is what Britain was when it was the sick man of Europe. Despite decades of economic decline, the EU elite carries on regardless. They are unmoved by criticism, untroubled by popular discontent. But the frustration of ordinary people is beginning to show. We now have to focus on constructing a firewall to prevent contagion within the Eurozone. What you can see everywhere is a conflict between the visions of a rather narrow uh, kind of professional middle class which has dominated European politics and the reaction against it by the larger bulk of the European population. 
Eventually, if you stuff dictatorship down the throats of people who don't want it, they will rebel. Unfortunately, in many places, it's taking a very unpleasant form of right-wing populist nationalism.